This is Lisa from This Jungian Life. We're excited to announce the launch of This Jungian Life Learning, an online educational platform that offers a chance to dive into Jungian topics more deeply. Our first offering will be a 12-month program called Dream School. The three of us will guide you in learning how to interpret your dreams so that you can learn the language of the unconscious. Jung said, in each of us there is another whom we do not know. He speaks to us in dreams and tells us how differently he sees us from the way we see ourselves. Learning to work with our dreams can help us hear the perspective of this other, leading to an abiding sense of aliveness, renewed creativity, and greater psychological wholeness. Dream work can help us resolve inner conflicts, shift how we approach interpersonal relationships, and help us to find our authentic ground. We're hoping to launch Dream School later on this summer. If you'd like to be one of the first to hear about it, please go to our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the banner link at the top to sign up for our email newsletter. Thank you. Welcome to this Jungian Life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. This week, uh, we are going to talk about dissociation, a topic that was suggested by a listener and that is uh, really very much at the heart of Jungian theory and concepts. Uh, we're going to talk about it from just a very human uh, experiential viewpoint, because from a Jungian viewpoint, it refers to an unconscious kind of fragmentation in one's personality of things that could and should be linked. And it also has to do with our ability to recognize, according to Jung, that psyche has parts, it has subsystems, and that this is simply our uh, basic operating structure and is a normal, recognized part of human experience on a spectrum uh, from this to something that's more severe. But today we're going to talk about it as just part of normal human experience and what it might take to heal our dissociative parts. Well, I think I want to just start off by mentioning that this was an important idea of Jung's from very early on in his career. He did his dissertation at university about what we might think of as dissociative phenomenon when he worked with his cousin, Helen Priestwork. She was a medium, and he uh, attended her seances and came up with a psychological analysis of what was happening that touched on this idea that the psyche is dissociable, that it's made up of parts. These parts can act autonomously. Absolutely. And um, it did uh, happen very much for Jung early in his career when he devised something called the word association test. And in this instrument, a person would be given a list of very ordinary everyday words, table, chair, water, mother. Uh, you can imagine that some of them have more of an emotional charge than, than others. And by carefully timing what the person's first immediate response was, patterns could be identified of places that had been dissociated when the person couldn't respond quickly or just came up with a rhyming word, for example. And that enabled Jung, uh, through this test, to identify places in the psyche that had been split off or dissociated and were not readily accessible to consciousness. Uh, this gave rise to many, many other parts of Jung's theory uh, le leading him to 
discovery of the collective unconscious and more. But for all of us, it's important to know that we have places that are not readily accessible to consciousness or are dissociated. And this is an idea that has been integrated into modern culture in a lot of ways in more familiar language. For instance, John Bradshaw's books on healing the shame that binds you, which were very, very popular, one of the things that he would do is have you talk to an inner child, write letters to an inner child, imagine them, draw pictures of them. And that's based exclusively in Jung's work, that we have an inner figure that we don't know a lot about, that is, in essence, split off. And if we were to imaginally foster a relationship, that somehow we become less symptomatic. And what you're also referencing, Joseph, with that, with the word shame is uh, how these parts of the psyche are charged with very strong feeling or affect. And that is basically why they have been relegated to the back burner, is that there is unintegrated feeling connected with these parts that we've dissociated. And we're really edging into a discussion of complexes in all of this. And uh, we have done a podcast specifically on complexes, but maybe it's just important here to mention that this was a key idea of Jung's, that he felt that complexes were kind of splinter personalities. They had their own autonomy to a certain extent, and they're only kind of loosely related to consciousness. The conscious personality is not in control of the complexes. And when a complex gets constellated, it can kind of take over consciousness for a little while. And you might even find yourself doing things that you don't remember or that you don't know why you did it. You feel sort of taken over. So again, this is really kind of baked in in a very deep way into Jung's view of the nature of the psyche. And this is so common, often we don't notice it. For instance, I think of a friend of mine who had a very, very contentious relationship with their mother, was recently at a board meeting, a high-level board meeting, and they brought in a new board member who was just particularly aggressive and uh, particularly edgy, a female. And my friend found herself bursting into tears in the middle of a board meeting mm. and had to leave feeling really embarrassed. Mm. And upon later reflection, what she realized is this person re reminded her in a very subtle way, actually, of memories of this very traumatic relationship with her mother. So the mother complex and the traumatized child complex had been cut away or dis associated, tucked away somewhere in the unconscious, slumbering away. And then in the face of this person who reminded her so much of her mom, all of those tearful, anxious feelings swept into her. Uh, she couldn't stop it. And at that moment, she didn't understand. And Joseph, you're referencing this important thing about the relationship between dissociation and trauma. And that is a way that we think about it a lot, that the psyche dissociates in the face of overwhelming trauma, and that can lead to symptoms later on when those aspects of the psyche are kind of tucked away. They're kind of creating tension underneath the surface, but we're not connected with them. The conscious personality isn't connected with them, so we don't even know where this roiling is coming from. And I think it is absolutely true that dissociation is a defense against trauma. And, you know, I can just share a kind of personal uh, story about that. I was, I was at one point uh, in a very frightening situation in which I was um, held at gunpoint uh, in, in my then home, you know, by a couple, a couple of men with uh, uh, semi-automatic weapons. And, um, there, there was a moment when I just lost consciousness. There, there were, it was a brief period of time when I don't remember what happened. I don't remember how I got from one place to another. 
Um, and I, and that was my psyche's way of just um, handling that extreme terror in that moment. And, uh, you know, that was a real lesson in what the psyche can do. And it's such a truly important protective part of the psyche that if we, if we cannot actually physically leave a, a difficult, threatening, frightening situation, uh, then we leave psychically by yeah. withdrawing consciousness from the situation when it's too much to bear. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really a, a self-preservation aspect of how we function. As we were talking about the traumatic saving impulse to dissociate, I was also thinking about how low-level dissociation is a natural experience for all human beings. Daydreaming is a form of dissociation. Watching television and not knowing how much time has passed is a form of very gentle dissociation. Highway hypnosis, um, you're on a 13-hour drive, and all of a sudden you're in some, you know, scenario in your mind and you're talking aloud and of course we see people as we're driving along <laughs> talking alone in a car very animatedly in a sense very natural time passes you miss your exit and you're thinking where was i mm -hmm. yeah you know, some part of you of course is driving the car and then sometimes uh, <laughs> something else is happening and so dissociation is natural and Jung wrote about the dissociability of the psyche as a natural phenomena. And clinically, we're concerned about the times when it interferes with what people think of as normal functioning or the ability to be happy and achieve your reasonable goals. Mm -hmm. Because if there's a great deal of dissociation, uh, which may have been uh, the result of trauma, including relational trauma. It doesn't have to be as overt and frightening as what happened to you, Lisa, but being dismissed or discounted or told you're wrong repeatedly. But if there's a lot of that that's accumulated, there's a huge internal cost to living one's life. Uh, and people you know, have that sense of, I'm living a life, but somehow I'm not fully alive in it because so much has had to be split off, dissociated, repressed, locked away somewhere. We might even say really that in a way that psychoanalysis or depth psychological process really is a healing of dissociations and inviting those parts, those complexes back to the table of consciousness to have a seat. One of the ways that I will imagine that in session is I'll tell a client very early on that you are ruled by a committee. and You just haven't been introduced to everybody who's sitting in the boardroom. I, I like that image a, yeah, a lot. That's great. that's great. It's not a simple thing, right, to have the ego be in relationship to the committee. And I would argue that we'll probably never fully know the committee, right? I mean, you, you can't, Jung said in various ways, various times, you can't empty the unconscious. Mm -hmm. So this isn't really a question of the ego masterfully uh, making all of this uh, explicitly conscious, but it is a question of trying to invite a relationship. So when I think about some of the ways that we can become aware of the inner committee or who populates our inner landscape aside from our waking consciousness or the ego. Dream work is the method par excellence that every time we wake up with a dream, we have an outpicturing of all these figures, animate and inanimate, that populate the inner environment. And when in the dream, I experience them as other. We have a sense that this is something which is not integrated into my sense of self, which doesn't mean that it's problematic. It means that it's just interesting. 
Yeah, there's way too much in the unconscious that isn't necessarily problematic or traumatic, uh, but that we just cannot hold in consciousness. Things that we never knew or things we can't remember or things that we thought were just incidental and got put on the back burner. And that some, that a dream will very often lift one of those elements back up and say, Hey, here's something that you might uh, want to pay attention to. Of like, Oh, yes. Okay. Good point. And in the dream world, when we have a particularly rejecting feeling towards an inner figure or object, that lets us know that there is a kind of determination to not be in relationship to something, that there's something threatening or disturbing about it. And of course, as an analyst, that that's the thing I'm immediately going for. <laughs> so, as soon as somebody says, you know, I hated that, you know, winged dragon that sh- showed up in my bedroom. So, yeah. I mean, that's the gold. Well, and that, that brings us into this kind of psychoanalytic idea about repression, right? Mm. I mean, and what's the relationship between dissociation and repression? You know, is it, are we talking about the same thing? Is that which is dissociated, has, has that been repressed? Do you think that's the same thing or is it slightly different? We're talking about something slightly different. Well, I think we're in that, that dialogue between classic Freudian descriptions of defenses and Jung's, I think, more plastic view of something that is not related to the ego yeah. comfortably yeah. or easily. Mm-hmm. The idea of repression and dissociation have uh, a similar meeting mm-hmm. because both of them are reflexive. We don't yeah. choose to dissociate and we don't choose to repress. And Yeah, right. So the, both of these are unconscious processes. Mm-hmm. And often they do come back in, in dreams uh, in ways where uh, the dreamer may report a dream of, of being uh, stalked by people or attacked by a wild animal, ordered around by authority figures. That that on waking and in, in, in working with the dream is sort of like, that's not me. Those are not parts of me. And that's often an indication of, of something that has been dissociated. You know, I am not a soldier uh, who, you know, orders other people around in, let's say, a prison camp. I, there's no part of me that's like that. Well, uh, something has been pretty aggressively dissociated, sp- split off or repressed that is, is still not even recognized as as a part of oneself. Freud also had a an attitude that we don't hear quite so much in Jungian circles, that repression was in service to the creation of civilization. That, for instance, all human beings, according to Freud, are capable of enormous physical aggression and fear-based attacking. And that in order to have a civilization, those primal attacking feelings have to be pushed way down in the unconscious Freud then felt there was evidence of the energy of that aggression coming up in, for instance, a great love of certain sports, football even, Mm -hmm. where the feeling of aggression then is tethered to really an aesthetic form, a kind of the art form of this athletic pursuit, but that it needed to be held down or else people would be too primal and even dangerous to each other. Joseph, this uh, point that you're bringing up about repression reminds me of a really interesting clinical phenomenon. I want to say just a minute about how I understand that. When the psyche uses dissociation, or if you want to call it repression, to disconnect from a traumatic experience, it's like something in the psyche casts a spell and just wants this thing not to be known. And that can actually constellate a field phenomenon where the analyst falls into an unknowing place as well. It's so powerful, the psyche's ability to disappear contents that need to be uh, split off. So so I want to share a rather striking example that I encountered a few years ago. 
I'd been working with someone for a while and I wasn't sure exactly what was going on with her. We'd, we'd just begun working together. We'd, you know, uh, seen each other a handful of times. And one day she came in with this story in which she related uh, some sexual abuse from childhood. And it was really clear in the way that she talked about it, that she was in and out of focus about it. Not that she absolutely forgot that it happened, but that it would just sort of disappear from her conscious awareness sometimes. And then she'd be like, oh yeah, and then this thing happened. So we'd, we'd met enough times that this was a little shocking to me that I hadn't heard it before. And she just kind of brought it in, in a fairly matter of fact way. But obviously in my brain, I'm going, wow, this is really important content. I've got to make sure that I you know, write this all down in the note later. I want to make sure I've got the story. So then I went to write the note a few hours later at the end of my day. You know, she talked about uh, difficulty with her partner this week or something. And I was like, I know there was something else. I know there was something else I was supposed to remember. And I could not remember it. I could not remember it. Now, eventually I did. And I was really struck because my psyche had been affected by the dissociative mechanism in her psyche she had trouble holding on to this content, and so did I. So it really constellated a field where we're not allowed to know. It really brings up the way that uh, there's different ways things can be dissociated. We can remember the traumatic fact, but we might not have any feeling about it. And that was actually the case for her. You know, she just kind of reported this to me matter-of-factly. It's like, oh yeah, you know, this thing happened. And that comes up a lot clinically where people can remember the thing, but they don't have any feeling about it, or they have a lot of feeling, but they don't remember anything. Yeah, there's a model for that. Um, it's called the BASC model. It's an acronym of a, a structure that was developed by a man named Bennett Braun. Uh, and it's about how we can split off or dissociate behavior, affect, sensation, or knowledge. And that's just what you were talking about, Lisa, of somebody remembers something um, and has the knowledge, but doesn't have the affect. Or someone may have sensation, physical ailment, or chronic stomach problems, or, you know, or something like where... body memory. Exactly. A body memory where medical knowledge cannot contribute or find any diagnostic physiological reason for it. Uh, so there's the body part uh, uh, with, without the knowledge and consciousness or the sensation part. Or somebody, we would say, might be in a complex and has a behavior that when certain things happen, uh, there's an action, a behavior that is out of real awareness or consciousness. So those are all ways that we can dissociate certain parts of ourselves, behavior, feeling, bodily sensation, or consciousness, while the rest of us goes on with our action or uh, some part of awareness. But it's just how things can get split up. I'm thinking about a clinical moment many years ago, which speaks to this partial dissociation. I'd been working with a, a woman who was really actualized in many ways, an, an artist, a wise woman, really just a, a lovely, powerful person. But I had always noticed that when she would walk into the consulting room, she would walk something like a ballerina and what I mean by that is she would walk and that her toes would touch first and then she would roll to her heel, which which is very unusual because most people, as they're walking unselfconsciously, you extend your leg and you touch the heel and you roll to your toes. So this was a, a different kind of motion. And after a while, I just kind of mentioned it and, and I asked whether or not she really did have a history as a dancer or, you know, a ballerina, something like that. And she said, no, no, no. And I, so I pointed it out to her and she didn't think much of it. But it, something about it kept me constantly fascinated 
by this unusual way of walking. And finally, one day, when she had walked into the consult room, I had this flush of feeling and said, you know, you walk as if you're afraid of making any noise. Wow. And all of a sudden, she kind of gasped and had to sit down and was um, shaking for a little while. Mm. And after a few minutes, she said, I am suddenly remembering years of my childhood where my father used to obsess about the sound of my walking on the second floor of the house and wow. would constantly shout up, you're walking like a horse. But there's something about the intensity of his monitoring that caused her to change how her body functioned, but caused her to, to put away all of the memories that would normally be associated with mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. so that the body kept the pattern the consciousness, you know, could not track it. Such a powerful example. And, and how just an interpretation. You linked it together again. Mm -hmm. right? That yeah. interpreting something attempts to reassociate something that was missing, creating a bridge. And when that bridge gets created and, and is really sturdy, there's a way that energy can move again. So there really can be a decrease in symptoms when links like that are recreated. And to that, over the next couple of weeks, and it took some conscious effort on her part, she started walking differently and also knows noticed that her hips felt better, her low back felt better, that there were a lot of discomforts associated with this unusual way of walking that were beginning to fall away. So it had a very practical value as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like the image of a bridge of relinking things uh, that got delinked because it was too painful to tolerate the affect like with your client of her supposedly heavy footed walking and the father yelling at her and how that got split off. The feeling got split off by having this kind of ballerina toe first walking. And, you know, I sort of imagine that after building that bridge and relinking it, that she might have been uh, freer in her gait of really you know, heel to toe, heel to toe, and having more uh, more vitality uh, available to her bodily and consciously. And, and psychically, it's like there's more energy available for life. The energy doesn't remain split off in that thing which is dissociated. And it takes a lot of energy to dissociate. It takes a lot of psychic energy to split something off and to maintain that split. And that is part of the cost. And that when the psyche is actively trying to keep these bits separated, there is less energy available for life. So restoring those connections in the way that you did, Joseph, really can infuse us with renewed vitality. And often, I think what happens is that we dissociate so that part of the personality can mature, perhaps in a more beneficial way. And it's later in life when the ego is strong enough that the self begins to press on us to relocate the lost parts. So it's a very interesting thing that, for instance, this person had gone through you know, 50 years or so and untroubled by that dissociation or repression and that when the time is right, the image of wholeness at the center of the personality, which we call the self, begins to lean on the personality and even brings to crisis the fact that there are split off parts. And Joseph, what you're saying reminds me of that dissociation when we're talking about it now as a defense against trauma mm -hmm. is very adaptive. It helps us survive. 
and it has its place and we need to honor it. And at some point we find that we outgrow it and it has become maladaptive. And that's when it's time to see if we can make those links. But that the psyche does this because it can be beneficial. It can allow us to survive. Absolutely. Well, now that we understand the incredible impact of stress on the nervous system and particularly the developing nervous system of children, the ability for the body and the self to minimize harmful stress by pushing it away, pushing it into the underworld, dissociating it, so there's more of a chance of a reasonable development. It's life-saving. Mm -hmm. I like what you said too, Joseph, that later on in life, uh, the self, the life urge in the psyche will begin to press for, okay, now it's time to address this. What was once adaptive is now maladaptive. It's leaching energy that might otherwise be uh, available for life. And that sometimes that can kind of create a symptom or a problem or whatever, which is or paradoxically just a of deadness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but is paradoxically the urge to life of understand me, process this. Th there's more uh, an urge here from the psyche to uh, heal something that had been put away in childhood. And I think that, you know, paradoxically, our symptoms really are attempts at cure. Mm -hmm. And those parts that may have had to be dissociated early on, later on want to be invited back in. You know, the three of us were talking this morning before we hit record about, uh, you know, fairy tales or archetypal material that can illustrate this. And I'm, we decided that it's just everywhere in fairy tales. So we can throw out a bunch of examples. But this particular way we're talking about it is making me think of uh, Sleeping Beauty. I mean, I think any time in a fairy tale where there's a kind of amnesia, which often happens because of a spell, you know, that the two lovers no longer recognize each other or one lover is bespelled and doesn't recognize, you know, his true wife or whatever. Yeah, those are images of dissociation. And Sleeping Beauty, of course, she pricks her finger on a spindle at the age of 15 and falls asleep, as does everyone else in the castle. And she sleeps for 100 years. So something in the psyche goes to sleep. And it may look like stasis. It may look like there's something dead. In that time, what happens is this tremendous wall of briars grows up around the castle that becomes impenetrable. So there's a real image of a defense that we're going to keep the outside world cut off. Something's really gone to sleep and it's going to be protected. But what's interesting is that something's happening while she's slumbering. Because eventually, you know, the self arrives in the form of the prince and it's time to wake up. The cycle has run its course and she's ready. Something has matured in the psyche. And it's like the princely part of her has now been awakened and she's ready to move out into life. So she's, she's ready to... Um, reconnect those things that were split off through this uh, slumber. I'm also thinking about those images of um, enchantment, going into the magic mountain or uh, leprechauns that sort of abduct a person, Rip Van Winkle, of, of all of those things. And that when the time is right, often is one of the themes of healing or maintaining some ego consciousness that when you're in the Magic Mountain or in Hades or something, you know, don't eat anything, don't drink anything. Remember that you need to uh, be able to come back out and maintain. So those are partial uh, dissociations. Mm -hmm. But it is all over the place, isn't it, in fairy tales and mythology? So that speaks to the 
natural dissociability of the psyche, bringing us full circle to Jung's observation, that he himself, in his inner sojourns, discovered tremendous inner factors that had been put, pushed away down into the unconscious, how alive they were, how much work it took for him to accept these inner factors and forge relationships with them, and how that helped him understand that factor in all of his and Alessand's, and to normalize it rather than pathologize it. Right. And we also talked earlier about how not all dissociation is in response to trauma. It's just like you were reminding us, Joseph, that it's just normal. I just wanted to bring in another fairy tale that I think includes a dissociative element where it's really delightful, is I'm thinking of the 12 dancing princesses, which if if you know that fairy tale, these 12 princesses dance, um, they need new shoes every day. And their father cannot figure out why. And so he uh, tasks someone with figuring it out. And I believe the hero winds up having a, a ring that makes him invisible or something. So he's able to follow them. And at night, they go to this fabulous kingdom where the trees are filled with jewels like emeralds and rubies. And they dance the night away every night. I mean, what a delicious way to escape into a a generative fantasy, you know, or at least a restorative one. Um, They may dance, they may dance their shoes to pieces, but they're, um, but it's a kind of wonderful adventure, which, which needs to be brought back to earth. I mean, it needs to stop eventually, but it certainly has its place and you get the sense that it's really enriching. And that's such an important point that the inner world is enriching. Mm-hmm. And we have access to that too. So maybe it's time to dance off into a dream. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this is Lisa from This Union Life Podcast. Joseph, Deb, and I have been deeply moved by your responses to our work. Producing, editing, and distributing the podcast involves substantial expenses, and we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisunionlife.com, and click on the heading be our patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month, and at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Thank you. Our dreamer is a 31-year-old male who works as an artist, and here's the dream. I find myself at the bottom of an archaic-like pit or well about five meters deep. There is very nice warm light coming into the pit, sandy golden and amber colors. I recognize it as a snake pit, but the space doesn't feel threatening. A large, four-legged snake appears. At this moment, I do feel fear, but also intrigued by this creature. I start climbing up a ladder to escape from the pit, and the creature stands on its back legs to tug me down with its teeth. The creature is not violent, but insistent. I make my way out of the pit that is bathed in warm light. The dreamer gives us his main feelings, intrigue, scared but not terrified, stunned by the light. He adds that he's been reading about four-legged dragons, about spirituality, and the psychoactivity of snakes in traditional Amazonian culture. Well, I guess I want to sort of say right at the top here that this is an archetypal dream, isn't it? It's such a big image. Uh, The the image of the snake, the dragon, is, I think, ubiquitous across cultures and uh, through time. So I find myself starting at the 
top of the dream that he finds himself at the bottom of a pit about 16 feet deep. We don't know how he's gotten there. The transition into this bottom is mysterious. So I have a curiosity and perhaps some fantasies about how does one fall into a pit or how does one get into a pit and not even know how we got there. But there's a feeling of danger, perhaps something injurious, tripping, falling, something that is probably not in the ego's full control. It gives me a feeling that the unconscious has taken hold of the dream ego and placed them somewhere that they would not normally have chosen for themselves. So I have a sense that his unconscious is really activated for some reason. Yeah, it's a curious image, isn't it? Because first of all, there is a sense of danger right away. Uh, I mean, when I read it, it's like, oh gosh, I'm at the bottom of a pit. But then there's this kind of beautiful light, which feels in contrast to that. And then the dreamer says uh, that he recognizes it as a snake pit, but the space doesn't feel threatening, which is a very interesting place to be. And here's a couple thoughts about that. First of all, I think about our colloquial use of the term snake pit to mean a place uh, where, you know, some situation that is riven with kind of interpersonal conflict and backstabbing and political machinations, you know, that's how I think about it. So it's a place where you better watch your back because people are out to get you. That's maybe the colloquial sense of it. And then I'm struck by the fact that he says it doesn't feel dangerous, which always could go a couple ways. When there's an inherently dangerous situation in a dream, pictured in a dream, and the psyche, the dream ego doesn't feel afraid, it's either that it really isn't as threatening as it seems, or it is threatening and uh, the ego is um, unconscious to that fact. The ego is kind of in denial. Yeah. The dream ego is like the ego in waking life and something has been dissociated. Yes. Yes. It, it would be a kind of dissociative thing. It's like, oh, uh, there's an example um given, I think, in uh, Dreams Portal to the Source of a dreamer having a picnic at the edge of a volcano. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, the dreamer's not, the dream ego's not concerned about it, but, you know, it's sort of like, hmm, you know, what's, would that be a good idea to have a picnic at the rim of a volcano? Probably not. So I just, I don't know which one it is in this dream, but I'm kind of just holding both possibilities there. So then this large four-legged snake appears. And um, in all kinds of traditions, there are uh, serpents with legs on them uh, that are kind of dragon-like. And again, our dreamer does not feel fear. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, he does feel fear, but is also intrigued. Great, he's not terrified. There's something coming online here that at the beginning... Everything is uh, sandy, golden, amber colors. It doesn't feel threatening. And now, uh-oh, um, here comes a four-legged snake, and some fear is starting to uh, arrive. It could be that this is an outpicturing of the dreamer's relationship with the unconscious and that it might show a slightly too kind of idealizing view toward the unconscious, you know, oh, it's amber glowing light and no problem. But then, you know, this snake appears and it's like, oh, okay, I guess, you know, shit's getting real here, <laughs> <You know? laughs> which would be appropriate. Like it's appropriate to have a little bit of awe, I suppose, when relating to the contents of the unconscious. And, and that comes online with the appearance of the snake. Now I would say it's a good thing that he, doesn't feel terrified. He's willing to, you know, he's intrigued. He's curious. That's always a wonderful attitude. When I think of the four-legged snake, it evokes kind of prehistoric images of the kind of evolution of species. And so I'm also wondering if he is getting a glimpse of an evolutionary process very deep in his own unconscious. I can imagine that being both glorious and also sobering. 
in as much as it is outside of the ego's hands. It's something that can be acknowledged, but not controlled by the ego. Yeah. You know, I have a slightly um, different take on this. I'm a little suspicious of how sort of nice everything remains. A large four-legged snake appears, really, and he does not feel fear, but is intrigued. Well, he does feel some fear. Some fear, but partly I'm a little suspicious of like, that would be pretty scary in the bottom of a pit. And then the dream ego does start climbing up the ladder to escape from the pit. So so I'm wondering if there's really more uh, fear, alarm, uh, sense of threat uh, than the dream ego is able to experience. You know, it stands on its back legs to tug me down with its teeth. And it's insistent, yeah. but you know, it's, it's, it's almost like a Deb, I hear what you're saying. And I, and I mm-hmm. hold that as a real possibility. And I, you know, I think it relates to my suspicion about the lack of fear that I mentioned before. Mm-hmm. The creature is insistent, wants to keep him in the pit, but then the mm-hmm. dream ends with him climbing out of the pit. So somehow this encounter with the creature didn't fully happen. That he flees from something that, might have been more transformative. Yeah. When we think of the dragon or the, the legged snake, we're also talking about something that is primordial, that feels very alien, that is not human, that the psyche is in touch with. And so, therefore, it is deeply unpredictable. Mm-hmm. When people have these deep, primordial activations of the psyche, it's normal for the ego to feel very frightened of what is going to be asked of it or struggle to even imagine how it's going to be reconfigured. Joseph, I wanted to go back to the point you made a minute ago, which I thought was a really interesting one about an evolutionary process with a a legged snake, because snakes do in fact have vestigial limbs. Mm. They have, you know, these, these, uh, bones where their hind limbs used to be essentially as part of their skeletal structure. So it, it really, you know, snakes did used to have limbs. And uh, so there, there is something there, I think, or snake precursors used to have limbs. Perhaps Mm -hmm. that's the more appropriate way of saying Mm -hmm. it. I did not know that snakes still have uh, vestigial limbs. Mm -hmm. That's my fact of the week. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Uh, Our dreamer says he's been reading about the spirituality and psychoactivity of snakes in traditional Amazonian culture. And I think what I'm considering here is he has an encounter, yeah, not um, maybe a fully developed encounter. Feels a little bit like a spiritual bypass, doesn't it? Yeah, it's tentative. Mm. And yeah. there, to, and I'm, you know, this this warm light and sandy golden amber colors of that ha, that somehow it's infused with a more sort of spiritual positive feeling tone than I would imagine a dream ego feeling in a, an encounter in a pit with a four legged snake. Mm-hmm. You know, it's also interesting to me that this dreamer didn't provide any context about his life situation, which I mean, not that we absolutely require that. But, you know, I, I would be interested in that if this dream walked into my consulting room. It's like, well, what's going what's going on in your life situation? And so it's a little intellectualized that he's been reading about the psychoactivity of this figure in Amazonian mythology or something. It's like, OK, but where is it in your life? Yeah. Yeah. I like your uh, phrase, the spiritual bypass. Mm -hmm. However, this may be uh, the first encounter. So it's somewhat tentative and the psyche's made it kind of safe. Yeah. um, Before plunging in. (laughs) And it's insistent. Yes. It's not going to let you go that easily. I think Mm -hmm. it'll be back. (laughs) I think it will be back. I also think of other clients I've had where ancient gods come into the picture. We often talk about the Greek gods, which are very anthropomorphic. They seem to have a kind of 
human society or civilization that's known to them were recognizable by the Greeks and Roman culture. But in the ancient world, his reference to the Amazonian cultures, the ancient gods are more theriomorphic, that they are often have animal heads or animal bodies. And the influence the theriomorphic gods have on a modern psyche is much more unpredictable and often can lead somebody away from cultural norms. Now, that can be very liberating for somebody who is an artist and wants to separate out from perhaps excessive influence or regurgitating cultural images into something that is truly archetypal and new and deep, but that comes at a cost to become an acolyte of an an ancient, almost pre-civilization image or ancient god, it comes with a certain burden as well. So I can understand the dream ego's ambivalence of being fascinated by that environment, but also being concerned about getting out of the environment. I'd also like to add just one other level of consideration, the soft, warm environment of the pit could be seen as a uterine environment, and Jung often typified the mother complex as a kind of dragon, mm. and the heroic journey is to escape the grip oh, that's great. of yeah. aggressive yep. mother complex. So part of him could stay in the soft, warm pit that the mother dragon that wants to keep tugging him down, not violently, but insistently, and that something inside of him needs the theatrical experience of resisting the tug and demanding this rising up out of the soft, warm place. You've been listening to This Jungian Life, from our website, thisunionlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this union life.